Good morning, and uh, yeah, first of all, I would like to thank Paul Finch, who for the fourth year in a row trusted uh, me and my partners at Plainsight to curate one of the panels uh, at WAF. It's always uh, a thrill to have free curatorial cards, so I thank you for that. So, um, this year's topic, flow, is for the built environment both very tangible when it comes to water flows such as river, oceans, rain, and it's also m quite intangible in some way when we talk about flows of people, data, power. The climate collapse that we are facing today, sorry for crushing your morning, but uh, despair is always a good ground for action, requires our commitment to repair the planet and to mitigate the negative environmental effects of the built environment to be high. So while putting together the concept of this panel, I could not help but wonder, what is one of the most important links that seems to be weak when it comes to tackle climate challenges and that seems to set us back from solving this, this challenge? Knowledge is surely one of them. So how do, does knowledge work? How does knowledge flow in architecture? I conducted interviews with multiple actors of the built environment to try to understand how knowledge on radical, restorative, and regenerative architecture could happen and uh, could be monitored. I settled to have on stage Casper Goldagen uh, Jensen from 3XNGXN and Christian Edwards from Snoheta as their dedication to create a more sustainable future was tangible. Kasper Guldager Jensen is senior partner at 3XN and director of the innovation company GXN, established in 2007. The goal is to innovate and apply new knowledge and technology into 3XN bodywork. The G stands for green, and the mission of GXN is to develop a building culture that positive, positively affects the world, both in terms of architecture and in terms of ecology. Casper, you are also passionately engaged in sustainability design, digital processes and new materials, focusing on circular economy and integration of new materials and green technologies. Christian Edwards, you are architect at Snoheta, active on a number of research projects, holding a key role in various studies integrating collaborative methodology for common platforms between scientific research, architects, and designers. Christian has been involved in the design and realization of a number of Snoheta's most ambitious zero emission projects, including the Harvard House Zero, Nidal V, Swart Plus Energy Hotel, and the B Pilot House. So I went visiting them both in Copenhagen and Oslo and ask them to engage in conversation with an expert in their own field on the topic of radical, restorative, and regenerative architecture. Together with my team, I captured these insights into um, two short video clips that we're gonna see shortly. So I'd like to welcome you on stage and thank you so much for both of you, as well as Stian and David, to have tagged along over the past weeks and months while developing this panel. It was surely a lot of fun and inspiration. So knowledge is a vast topic, and um, I would like for this conversation to be meaningful, to frame it on three aspects of it, which is learning, thinking, and teaching. <coughs> so if we look at the learning aspects, before watching the first video, I would like to start the conversation by um, asking one question to both of you. Um, it seems that sustainable design, or the way that we talk about sustainability in architecture, is no longer enough in terms of matching the urgency of repairing the environment. So we need to move towards a regenerative architecture. So what is the one piece of knowledge that you gathered over the past decades that made both of you transition from one to another? I can start. Um, to be honest, I don't think we ever moved out of sustainability as a concept to begin with. I think regenerative architecture, that as you 
as you point out, is actually part and parcel of the same task. So really, it's more of a development of the, let's say, of the idea uh, of sustainability as a holistic practice rather than simply um, performative aspects. I think we've seen some of those kind of um, presentations about way that people talk about sustainability as more this kind of additive uh, situation that there are performative things that we can add to our buildings, uh, methods, and, and it's a kind of, okay, we've done that, now we can concentrate on the architecture. I'm not sure that that's particularly the case, and I, I know that's not how we think about it. If we reflect on some of the conversations that have been had, or some of the presentations even, um, we can get into that a bit later, but it's a whole discussion about the terminology and the way that we talk about it. What's interesting about when, when Kim and, and you, Kasper, also presented, and the way that we talk about sustainability is actually we don't really mention the word that much. So when it's integrated or interwoven into the practices, then you know, we don't need to talk about um, we don't need to talk about sustainability as a as an add-on in the same sort of way. Um, <coughs> so uh, it's a tough question just to fire out like one thing in the past decade uh, that we learned the most from, or is that like correctly? But I think um, it's always uh, I think uh, one thing. Uh, I have two things, but one thing would be collaboration. Um, that. I mean, we're trained as architects to uh, kind of see the, maybe not see the future, but have visions for the future, where do we want to um, see um, the built environment go, uh, how do we want to live. But I mean, we are not, we're also coming to a, a, a shorthand pretty quickly, I think, as architects, if we don't collaborate. So I think like we, we really always collaborate, uh, not just with uh, obviously like uh, 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 engineers and clients and uh, the usual suspects, but but we also, in in all our projects, try to take some kind of art knowledge in, uh, or uh, or some exciting knowledge from uh, from other uh, fields. So I think like collaboration is really what we learned the most from. And then also I found that uh, the second thing would be um, open source. So everything we learn, we share. And and what's happening is that uh, then we get really good friends with. Um, Snuheader or like-minded uh, um, people in, in the world of, uh, you can say, uh, visions for a regenerative future or uh, new thinkings about how our buildings affect uh, our lives, our behavior, um, all that. So, so I, f I found like this just to get out, share all the knowledge. It actually just then creates this ripple effect that you know, <laughs> ripples out, but it also ripples back. And, um, and I think that's interesting because, I mean, we are trying to do something new and um, <coughs> you don't want to do something new alone. I mean, you need, you need like, a, to, to create a kind of a, a, a group of, uh, a, of energy around you. So, so you, you shouldn't do things alone. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, I mean, when it comes to regenerative architecture, it's not so much in terms of uh, forgetting about sustainability, it's more narrowing down what we mean by, susta by sustainability, in the sense that in a regenerative concept, you need to balance what you are using, what kind of resources you are using, versus how you do you repair this depletion. So, where do you see the biggest challenge happening today when it comes to regenerative architecture? in both your practices? Just to, <coughs> to start with, um, like the word uh, regenerative or regenerative, I mean, it's, uh, it's new to many. Uh, so, um, also new to me some years ago. Uh, I, I met um, this uh, Canadian architect, Peter Busby, uh, in, uh, at a conference in Las Vegas, of all places, <laughs> to talk about sustainability. That was really weird. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, but he's like, I just, realized that from now on I will only do regenerative architecture. And I just kind of heard the word before, but I mean, so just hearing him saying like that's his mission from now on was um, very inspiring. So I also uh, backtracked his, uh, his work and, uh, and saw the buildings. And I think like, so regenerative is that you can regenerate, like you can, you can like create positive footprints. It's not just about, you can say like uh, making buildings that creeps towards zero in, uh, in kind of a bad impact, but you actually can make uh, positive footprints with your buildings. So 
I think uh, it's a whole mindset that's kind of the, the toughest. You need to reverse that and see like, how can we create, um, how can we create buildings that breathe or clean the air, or that, as you started out saying, like cleaning the water, um, <clears throat> and 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 I think think this mindset is really uh, uh, hard to tackle because I think the industry is really just trying to like, how can we do how can we do things right with, with a less uh, bad impact, uh, and um, and then trying to focus on how can buildings actually be part of a, a kind of a scalable positive solution. Um, I think when we we talk about that as well, it's the regenerative, you know, one is talking more specifically about the buildings and revitalizing, renewing, uh, reappropriating buildings in certain ways, but also it's, it's if we want to talk about repair or regeneration in that respect, then I think also it's the process. There is a, something broken in the process that needs repair. Uh, you know, if waste and redundancy um, is the result of a process, then that process is broken. Oh, we need to sort of discuss this level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. And I mean, talking about broken, I think it's the perfect uh, transition to the first video that uh, I want us to watch. Um, I went to visit you and uh, Stian in uh, in Oslo, and we. So I asked you to engage in a conversation with um, with somebody, and in that case, it was Stian, Alessandro, and Kenneth Rossi. Um, who spearheaded an out-of-the-box learning initiative and that led to a regenerative output. So I suggest we watch it. was the economy around this material. It, it, it costs for the fishermen to get rid of it. Now you actually can cash it in and not only do you have like new products, but you also have an economic upside to the sorting out of the material. I mean, it's a win-win situation. What we're trying to do, not only by making a product, this is a statement and, I, and it's kind of manifestation of the whole plastic research through this chair. It's the whole industry that is about to change they see value in it now, and as long as they see value, they will never throw it away. We have to go very much into the sort of finite details of the material itself, uh, understand its composition, where it's come from, basically from its raw material to how its end of life cycle, how that is actually uh, occurring, how that's actually being dealt with. Everything we learned from the plastic process, we charted it and we tried to think back and see what did work and what happened that enabled us to, to, to zoom out and then zoom in and become an expert on the unknown material. And, and like now we're trying to do the same with the new material. So when you get information like that, then you start realizing that, okay, this is actually the, the leftovers of this material shouldn't be used. That's so basic, but still so difficult to spread around the world. And that is the primary task we need to enhance, is the, the basic knowledge of the basic materials that we have left. So what struck me both at 3XN, GXN and uh, Snoheta is yeah, this aspect of basic knowledge on basic materials and how actually the emphasis given on materials research started, which seemed to be a little bit off-road. Um, you, Casper, when Kim asked you to <coughs> join 3XN, your answer was to say yes, but I want to start an innovation hub that would research materials and that where we would almost step back and go off-road of the normal architectural practice and actually start by studying. Um, same for you at Snoheta, you are very incentivized, every single of you in the company, to lead some project almost as hobby and to push certain aspects of your research, which for instance um, con led Stian to conduct this in-depth research on the full cycle of plastic. 
And we can see then the outputs are significant both for your practices. I mean, 3XN, GXN, and, and Snow Heta, both in terms of the reputation and also the, the um, quality of your outputs. Um, so it seems that before the business as usual, so before the making, there is the need of the learning, there is the need of the studying. So, Casper, um, what made you decide to take a step back and um, study materials? <coughs> Well, it, uh, it started when I was uh, an architect student. Uh, I was, um, I was uh, taking one year to, uh, to the west coast of uh, California to, uh, to go to SIARC, uh, uh, like Southern Californian uh, Institute of Architecture, because uh, I knew that they could do things with the computer that I couldn't learn in, uh, in, in Denmark or in Europe for that, that matter back then. So, um, so I actually went there just to get like, really zoomed into the computer and like, what can you do with... Uh, algorithmic design and animated design and uh, uh, kind of a living geometry and, uh, and I was that was I was really dedicated to that but also uh, my uh, professor Peter Tester he uh, he kind of offered that I mean he he explored uh, uh, kind of uh, advanced constructions and uh, crazy geometries um, but also he said well this is uh, I mean all fascinating but completely uninteresting if you can't uh, realize it if you can't kind of bridge what you are dreaming into how you fabricate it or the materials that you make it of. So one day he took me to, uh, or the, all the students, to uh, a desert, uh, the Nevada desert, as a factory making uh, sails for uh, America's Cup uh, performative uh, sailing. And um, <coughs> I got, got into this uh, room uh, size of, uh, of this uh, conference uh, um, uh, space and um, and there was like these huge molds, like in, in architecture, we do things that are like maybe up to like eight, 10 meter long, but this like, it was spanning 50 meters, like one big mold, and it was like uh, built on scissor lifts. Uh, so it could kind of uh, reconfigure, uh, like, you know, like m uh, mass production, individual mass production. And uh, above the molds, there was like some rigging, like, uh, like we see here. And there's like people uh, being uh, lifted up and down. Uh, and robots that were like crawling over the mold with uh, uh, Kevlar fiber and carbon fiber, making these kind of super beautiful performative patterns uh, of, uh, you know, like new materials, new performance. And everything was kind of linking a kind of very kind of complex uh, form finding uh, exercise from, you know, like fluid uh, computer uh, dynamics uh, to, to enable something uh, uh, that, that was like just beautiful in itself. But then I was like, from then on, I never kind of uh, did anything without thinking about which way you could produce it, what materials you could do it with. So I think it started there. And then also when you're like in at that kind of material focus, you also want to kind of reverse that. Like with, with the materials we built, uh, it matters uh, that, uh, that, that they can be reused and that you can establish these kind of ecosystems. So, so, so it's kind of uh, coming from like a total digital kind of fascination into uh, a kind of a deep material uh, kind of new world. Um, and I also think I've, I've then have like several kind of, uh, <laughs> what's it called, like uh, movements of uh, excitement and uh, delusion. And um, I think uh, somehow now it's, it's what, what, what really fascinates me is how we can uh, scale things up, not just how we can do you know, like... Uh, 3D print something like super uh, spectacular, or we can do some very advanced, uh, you know, like composite uh, hybrid. I mean, so I really think what we talk about, like tectonics and wood and uh, joints, and uh, kind of like just like at an industrial level, is, is kind of where we are now, uh, but still with the fascination of, uh, of, of, of the design, not just of space and buildings, but also of materials. Mm -hmm. And um, talking about materials knowledge, um, Christian, what are some common misconceptions that uh, people have on materials knowledge? And how can we combat these misconceptions and um, communicate more effectively? It's an interesting question. I think um, certain misconceptions, perhaps, when it comes to material research, is that that's, it's the responsibility of someone else. Um, and that we can, as architects, as designers, we can simply take that information and put it, uh, compose something with that material and then expect it to perform. But if we don't know the particulars of the material itself, its composition, and all the way down to uh, so w where it's sourced from uh, as raw materials and things like this, then as Casper, I think, is, is pertaining to that, um, that kind of deep information 
it's actually informing your design processes. Um, you wouldn't know that you could do these giant spans if you hadn't seen that in action. Um, when it comes to communicating, I mean, I guess that's the, that's the challenge of, uh, of education uh, in some ways, and also creating opportunity for, for that exploration within practice, as, as you guys do, as we do. Um, and spreading that, proliferating that generally amongst um, amongst practices in as it goes. But let's say that um, as designers, two sort of approaches, well, there's no two same s approaches to the same challenge. So that sort of deep knowledge is potentially um, for each individual to have and to and to utilize in the design process. But also, if we can share that knowledge, I mean, at the same time this sort of urgency that you, you're talking about, that we, we feel every single day, is, um, is so urgent, in fact, that if we don't share the basic deep knowledge that we have, then we're simply creating uh, micro-specialists without any kind of, uh, any kind of chain or, or way of uh, collaborating or interacting with the knowledge that they do have. And that's, that's where, and I completely agree, Gaspar, this is where we need to be moving on is actually improving the collaborative basis to allow, uh, to sort of liberate that knowledge and use it for a common, a common purpose. Uh, I think also what, uh, what we're driven by and what uh, you're extremely good at and what we see in the video is like, we need also tr to translate this into some, uh, you know, like beauty, some aesthetics, uh, and, uh, and that's the power of design and architecture. But also I think what you're doing with that chair is also, you know, like introducing a kind of a new aesthetic, which is like the deeper meaning of actually uh, through uh, uh, this chair and uh, through uh, the waste that you're showing, you could actually uh, start uh, talking about ocean waste as a, you know, like a, uh, where, where, where you provide solutions. And uh, I think I think we see that a lot with our clients that, that, that it's not enough just to do like uh, a, a great building. It needs to have like a deeper uh, message and it needs to answer something deeper or bigger. Uh, and I think that's that's what, what, what I see here. It's a beautiful chair and it has like an agenda uh, it gives answer to. And I think we need to do that with our buildings as well. And, and uh, luckily, I mean, uh, maybe like five years ago, uh, that, that was more like uh, somebody on a stage like this saying it, but now it's also the, uh, the, the, the clients and, 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 and I guess uh, also the society uh, that, that asks for it. Uh, so I think that's uh, that's fascinating that the times really are changing and, and, and we need to be able to give answers to more than just, you know, like the um, uh, the given geometry and the, the, the kind of the individual uh, footprint. But yeah. I also find, sorry if I can just shoot in, I think um, what I also find interesting when it comes to materials and, and these kind of misconceptions, let's say, is, is through the looking at these meta information that's actually attributed to the material itself, the chair. Uh, interestingly, uh, Stian's been leading some, um, some information about what, that met, what those meta values are. So what is its um, ecological footprint? Or what is its emission footprint? And essentially, with a few adjustments, with the amount of recycled steel and the processing of that, then actually the, the weight of the chair itself in the physical world is the same as its CO2 footprint. So it's 4.2 kilos and 4.2 kilos. This kind of information is is super interesting. I still don't know what to do with it, <laughs> but I think it's I think it's really interesting. I and mean, when we can see like um, materials lined up with in small amounts, small volumes, and then its impact in, on the larger scale, in the scale that we don't see, but we know that it's having an effect on our environments. Then I think that's um, there is some deep learning that I think will hopefully revolutionise the way that we we talk about buildings and and use of use of materials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, uh, in terms of, uh, of materials, there is something that, uh, that uh, when we talk about the, the thinking aspect of creating knowledge, it's a lot about the mindsets that we have. And uh, one thing that was very interesting when I visited you in uh, Copenhagen was the, the scarcity mindset. So to really look at the, at the resources and uh, applying the mindset that we should all have, which is, which is around how, how scarce resources are. And um, it seems that a curse that the built environment still has, even if like resource scarcity is being brought up mm. on the table more and more, is that 
architects often tend to still consider that their resources are fairly endless. And um, the, when we see some I mean, when we see some evolutions or some trends such as the, the rush towards timber, it shows us the still very partial understanding that we have around resource depletion, such as uh, habitat threatening um, process in, uh, in forests. So um, in the second video that we're going to watch, Casper, you had a discussion with uh, David Garcia, who is uh, architect as the MAP architect, also associate professor at the Royal Danish Academy of Architecture. David developed a master program which is named Extreme Environments, where he basically provides all of his students with a mindset, which is resource scarcity. So let's watch it. In essence, extreme contents are just an excuse to have a new pedagogy with a new generation of architects to empower them to take more inventive approaches to design. When you start to talk about teaching new generation of architects, it's almost impossible to make them think out of the box if they have to design within the luxury of our cities. Moving them to an extreme context is a very radical, immediate way of making them understand that they need to rethink perhaps how they've been seeing architecture, understanding architecture. If you want to create the world of tomorrow, you can't just practice the solutions of today. That's also what you are providing the students with a mindset to actually like rethink now today's challenges, environment, uh, today's you know, like everyday crisis and global crisis combination of research and, and practice that you have at 3XN uh, and GXN are very much about trying pushing the limits but also dealing very much with what are the, the problems at hand. And I think if, if that happens in practice and in education then the synergy becomes very obvious. The only way to survive in a practice in a long term is that you invest also in how the, the future might be and not only how to respond to the immediate present. Not only as a strategic way of, uh, of making a practice work, not only as an ethical compass that everybody should have. It's a survival help. strategy, but it's a survival strategy. So, yeah, talking about this topic of uh, resource scarcity, how did you see the topic evolving or changing over the last five years? And um, what do you predict will happen in the next five to ten years? Um, <coughs> I just have to say thank you. I think that movie is so nice. It's, uh, it's really uh, fantastic to kind of... Uh, I almost feel like I'm with David right now when uh, you're showing that. I mean, the way he, um, uh, he, he works with the students, I think that's fantastic. Uh, I mean, because we can't... I mean, we can talk about extremes and extreme challenges we have, uh, but it's really hard to kind of sense when you're like in the comfort of a kind of a, a developed city and uh, you are like uh, in the Mas Maslow pyramids of needs. I mean, you're like uh, you're like all the way in the top. So it's it's really, I mean, maybe that's also when you actually can start to address uh, um, like uh, a deeper uh, understanding of crisis. But he takes his students out. Um, to uh, extreme environments of the, the Sahara Desert or the Amazon jungle and uh, Chernobyl uh, atomic uh, leftover cities. So I, I think when you then are in, in those contexts, it's quite clear how, uh, how you need to create a balance of materials, of energy and water, and how you need to um, work with the local context. And then when you then come back to uh, Amsterdam, for example, you you see uh, this uh, still, you kind of uh, kind of it takes away the kind of the, the, the kind of the, the curtains of comfort, and and you see like well it's as present even more like accelerated presence here, uh, and and I think that's 
I think that that was uh, good to have him uh, be part of the uh, of, of the panel somehow. Um, and I think uh, we, we just see like you ask like the five past five years what's happened. I mean, I think this is uh, it's quite clear that. Uh, but maybe we see this kind of separation of uh, uh, you know like some countries that don't act and some cities that act, but like, I, th I think like the most important is I see a, a population and a generation that, uh, that, that wants to do things differently. Um, so, so that's kind of the, the, the bottom up uh, uh, urgency. Uh, I think uh, everybody, uh, or almost everybody is aware that there's like a burning platform that, that we need to act upon. Uh, but also we see it uh, top down. Um, uh, we see it uh, at, at a kind of a political level, but also uh, just one-to-one uh, -one when we are, 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 are dealing with, uh, with projects and clients, that this is a way that uh, th these are answers we need to come up with. And, and it's, it's really different from five years ago, what we uh, are being asked to, to, uh, to answer today. Uh, and and that's, I think that's a, a, a big shift and gives me a lot of hope. Uh, but still, uh, we're looking uh, at an industry and, 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 and an economical, logical uh, system that is it's, it's really hard to do things differently. So it's not like it's, it's easy, but I think, uh, I, I think it's possible because you're being asked not just by your own consciousness, but also uh, it's, it's, it's some, some way to differentiate yourself. Um, last uh, week I was in uh, Lausanne in Switzerland uh, for like an uh, Olympic uh, think tank. Uh, with uh, the IOC, so what are the future kind of uh, uh, license to operate for like a big Olympic event? I mean, and, and, and as you said before, I mean, uh, those two kind of main findings, they need to like have like full like climatic transparency, but they also need to make a legacy. Uh, so legacy is uh, after this event, um, you need to have kind of a regenerated the, the city or the, uh, the country or the uh, the nature. I mean, so, so there's a lot of focus on how can, how can we, with what we do, when we work and put for enormous amounts of resources and time and effort, how can we regenerate uh, with the Olympics, for example, that, that used to be like really only about the peak, but now it's really about the afterlife. So that's, that's a good example on, on, on how it's different now. Yeah, totally. Yeah, no, I think it's, I think it's super interesting. I will that approach to actually seeing scarcity in, in the physical realm and not being able to experience it at home, for example. I mean, there, there's no challenge there, but you know that it's come from somewhere. That is, I think it's, um, that's a very interesting approach. And looking at the regionality, if you want to talk about maybe the, the next five to 10 years, what, what will happen or, or what we should be preparing for is, is rather than the scarcity uh, manifesting itself in regions and then forcing some some kind of rush of innovation okay that's great but usually it's based on on some kind of very very quick um, methodology or quick process that that has some kind of wider impact that we don't really understand um, but maybe we can prepare some frameworks for for regions that we know will experience scarcity or by making good models for us or for ourselves at home uh, and exporting that. In, I mean, w talking about that, I mean, the example of the Olympic Village is quite interesting. I think, unfortunately, still stays uh, an exception in the sense that your clients, I mean, developers, and one step further, banks, I mean, funding institutions, um, are, I think, either not very aware of resource scarcity or not very interested in terms of the immediate return or the short, mid, long-term return on investment that they expect. So how can you as architects, what's your range of action to try to infuse this knowledge or these insights on resource scarcities to your clients, which ultimately are the decision makers? I think it's interesting is too, I did get a sneak preview of your, of your question yesterday. I thought there was maybe two, two ways of, uh, of approaching it. One is actually, um, the interesting cases, for example, uh, Mark Curley was uh, showing yesterday with the super lofts and, and the, the co-building, mm -hmm. um, where actually the architects themselves are taking the risk and <coughs> becoming design and builders. That's one where, I mean, that's obviously some, something super interesting. 
Uh, and maybe just having one project like that would enable you to, uh, to transfer that knowledge to, to a process with a client. Um, but I think also certainly what was being, there is a sort of need for quantification and, and an explanation of what you can actually save or what you can actually provide by re reappropriating the materials that you already have. Somebody's bought a site more often than not. Uh, it's an expensive site, and it's got a building already existing on it. Uh, Kim showed a great example. I've seen that one before with the, with the savings in Sydney, for example. By just retaining the building, a third of the building costs, or retaining the superstructure, or half the building, a third of the building costs are already there. So it's, it's more of an information, I think. Uh, and to do that, we need to understand those quantities, and we need to do some numeric work. Yeah, I think that's... Uh that's definitely, and we, we need to be able to kind of talk that, that language or like make that, um, uh, make that uh, value visible um, and, and also like talk about it as a value. I think, uh, I think that's, that's a challenge uh, and we need to, uh, to provide kind of a new language uh, on, on how we uh, talk about our buildings and the impact of our buildings and, and the value of our buildings. Um, and I think that's, that's uh, quite uh, hard, uh, I think. Uh, but uh, historically, like uh, engineers have have been really good in, in values and numbers. I mean, and 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 part of me think that is a uh, way we should strengthen ourselves. And another part is, uh, I mean, it shouldn't be because just like about uh, values and numbers. So I'm a little uh, in conflict here. Um, but we 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 try to um, to somehow uh, talk about the value. Um, and not the cost of uh, sustainability. Uh, I think that's fundamentally like a really uh, important way to to try to uh, uh, get this message through. Um, so when we, um, yeah, for example, that um, we're doing a, 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 the high rise in, uh, in in Sydney where we are maintaining what's uh, uh, the full superstructure of an existing high rise, and we're doubling the square meters, but we're doing that in a way so we are saving the, the client uh, more than 100 million uh, Australian dollars in, um, in, 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 in material and time uh, saved. Uh, but also, we are then adding uh, new layers to the buildings that, where we talk about like this is a easier maintenance because we, uh, we work with kind of a modular concepts uh, that ultimately also are circular and reusable. Uh, we talk about um, flexibility in buildings. So buildings, they can kind of change their layout, they can change functionality. So I think that's, that's also a way to like be very practical and talk about value. Like your building can actually uh, adjust itself to the change uh, and the needs of the future uh, with, with some different uh, flexibility strategies. Um, we just uh, completed a competition here in, in Amsterdam where, I mean, then it was uh, the city uh, asking us really to uh, come out like uh, with strategies for flexibility, for upcycling, for urban mining, for energy generation, for water cleaning, for nature enhancement. And that's like, that's all uh, kind of uh, parameters that were in the tender process. Uh, so I guess like uh, it, it comes, I mean, so, so those banks and investments uh, uh, partners we have, they also need to react to that because that's uh, becoming requirements for cities, or at least when we have dialogues with city officials. I mean, if we can talk about all the values and the positive uh, societal and uh, contextualized impacts uh, our, our buildings have, then you have a much better dialogue. I think, I think we really, uh, I think maybe that's a, a value that we bring to, uh, to, to our clients. It's not just uh, the, the you know, like the, the, the looks and the, the square meters, it's really also creating a, a dialogue, uh, a smooth dialogue with the, with the cities where we built in. Um, yeah, so I guess like turning, sure, turning um, it into a, a, di a dialogue of, of value creation and not just, uh, yeah, yeah, problems we need to solve. I'm, I'm wondering which, uh, I mean, what's the proportion of these, you know, interested or, or mindful clients versus all the built environment, or like all the construction industry being currently ongoing in the sense that uh, I'm sure that you by your ethos and identity also attract projects where there is, there is a true awareness around ecological um, <coughs> challenges versus 
yeah, again, what the proportion of the construction industry nowadays. So I'm wondering, I mean, which is not necessarily uh, a question to answer, but like, is there always a case for for value and for, I, I see what you mean about redefining your language, I'm just wondering if we're not running out of time to speak a language and create value and create metrics, as you say, to convince clients that this is the right way to go, while for sure you're not tech writers and you're not decision makers, you are, you are service providers, but at the same time, what you, are being, what you are designing every day will stand in the cities tomorrow. And uh, I'm just curious to see how long will that take us to come to the understanding that we're running out of time, resources are more than ever scarce, and by the time that developers and banks will understand this is too late, like where are we gonna be? So, but perhaps on, on that matter, I'm curious as a, as a last question to, to know from you guys, like, do you feel we are radical enough when it comes to architecture? No way. <laughs> no way. Um, when it comes to the, the challenge that we're actually looking at, we either believe it or we don't believe it. So if you believe it, you have to go all the way in. Um, and it's, it's not something we can do on our own. If we believe that, then we're fooling ourselves. Um, there's a couple of things that are, uh, some terminologies that popped up or have been popping up recently in terms of um, one I picked up yesterday, in terms of uh, net carbon ready. Okay, so there's two questions. It either is or it isn't, uh, or net zero carbon ready, I should say. And then what is it ready for? I mean, what are you waiting for? Who are you waiting for? It's the same kind of idea that everybody, it's a collective responsibility if we're gonna hit the targets that we want to hit. And this, you know, we, um, maybe you caught in uh, Dizine, Chatil uh, had a, an interview which uh, stated that for the next 30 years, I mean, it's kind of interesting. Our practices are all in the um, UN studio, GXN, 3XN, 3XN, and us. The sort of 30-year epiphany or nexus, let's say, to move on, um, and what that is. Um, so we've basically launched a strategy to say that all of our buildings within 10 years will be carbon neutral. Um, and that's based on the understanding that we actually have through having executed these projects. Um, and then in the next 30 years, they'll be carbon negative. And what that means, uh, uh, we don't actually know. But carbon negative suggests that we're taking something out of the atmosphere and replacing it in the ground because we've basically been burning some other um, era or uh, you know, basically a carbon account that we, we've been borrowing from. And now we need to return the funds if we actually have any chance of coming uh, to a position of maintaining one and a half degrees um, Paris, then we're, you know, we're already looking that we, that will be surpassed within the next 10 years. So we have to be radical. And this is basically an invitation. We got lost maybe in some, in some terminology, but uh, it's basically an invitation to come and to talk to all of us, um, come with ideas, let's lift them up, let's lift them up together. And, um, that's really as radical as we can be, is, or as only as radical as we can be, is if we all pull together and just somehow break down these silos, break down this idea of a competition and keeping it. We, can still, we still have to be profitable, we still have to make money, but we can all do that together and lift, lift the region. Yeah, um, <coughs> we're, f we're for sure not being radical enough if, uh, if what we do today should be the answer for tomorrow. Because, uh, I mean, we sit in a part of the world where the uh, total consumption like is uh, two or three or four times like what the, the, the world actually can kind of uh, contain. So, so we are like over consuming and we are um, we, we're not doing uh, this in a regenerative way. Now you are like putting forward the, the, this as a kind of a benchmark. I think that should be a benchmark, not just like to go in, in kind of a, a clean balance, but like how can we uh, create positive footprints with, with what we do, uh, but but I mean you can also uh, you can also be like just go on the radical path, and then you can't do anything. So so you need to be able to find the right ones to change uh, the world. Uh, and I, I think sometimes you are able to take like big steps, and other times uh, with some projects you take smaller steps. And it's um, and it's just important to keep pushing it. And, uh, and, and, and also, I think, we, uh, as an architect, you, uh, at least I, I, uh, I mean, I, I work in, uh, in everything from like a material scale to kind of political scale. 
Uh, so we really tried to uh, change the legislation and uh, uh, put kind of forward uh, kind of uh, uh, kind of the, the, the kind of uh, the uh, uh, legal framework for for what we do, and we also try to uh, encourage uh, uh, the, the the use and development of of, of, of new kind of uh, um, ecosystem inspired uh, materials and ways to build. Uh, but but we can't do it alone, and uh, I think the best we can do is, uh, I mean, we also say no to uh, to to uh, to some jobs where it's it's not pushing in the right direction. But I think we need to, you know, like. I think we need to like be very clear about what is the, the goal, where 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 are we heading, but we can't just say like I'm not doing anything until I can do this. We need to uh, move with, with others, and also we need to, uh, to 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 learn by the steps we are taking, because it is um, it, it it is I mean uh, it is an answer we need to give, but it will take uh, uh, it will take decades to get there. Uh, but but I think what we can do is also provide a kind of a blueprint or a, you know, like uh, something that 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 we can uh, uh, lay out and can be copied and can be scaled. So uh, so I think that's important that that what you do is not just your buildings. It's 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 uh, somehow kind of a uh, in, in best uh, best case a blueprint for others to kind of uh, uh, move uh, move with. So so that's what I'm hoping for. We can we can keep focusing on the kind of the the, the real goal and and, 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 and and take steps that we can uh, uh, share with others. Very good. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for your time. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And uh, at the end of the conversation, wishing everybody a great day. Thank you, guys. Thank you.